key so for the for, for, for the for the products so for the technology uh, diffusion initiative so it's public finance and also I think there is uh, each in the, in, the, in the context of China so there is the special institutional arrangement so which coordinated the, the stakeholders so in the process so at the central government level the, the, the uh, a number of government agencies so involved in the process for example the Ministry of Finance so and uh, the National Development Reform Commission, and also uh, and, uh, so the, the, the NDRC, which is in charge of the approval of the, any investment projects, and also the National Energy Administration. So they are provide, uh, they are design the program and be, t take the primary responsibility for implementing the, the initiative. And also the, the Office of Poverty Evaluation of the City Council. So. So at, the, so at the central level, uh, government level, there is a coordinating uh, mechanism so the, uh, to make sure so the, the, how to say, the joint efforts can be, uh, how to, can be how to say, put in a right place. So this is at the central level. At the local government, also similarly structure so at the central government. Of course, so in, the, in China, the, the big companies, the state grid company, and the two, the two grid companies, so the, the state grid companies, once the state grid company and the soft grid company, they play a very important role. So for the ground, for the uh, electricity grid extension, and also uh, uh, guarantee the, the 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 connection of the of, of the solar PV uh, systems, <clears throat> and also the of course and the local uh, the, the participation of a local community. So I think the, the uh, so these are. The, the, the three items, I think, are the major, uh, how to say, uh, contributors to China's uh, rural ele electrification uh, program. And uh, <clears throat> maybe, so, and maybe, so this, maybe this is some lessons so can, can learn from China. So one is we need to sustain a strong political will. So I think this is very important. So then this political will lasts more than uh, 30 years. So, so without the, 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 the political will, I, I don't think it can happen. So, and uh, second is the technology innovation. So you can see face by face, so there are some new technology uh, uh, come so in place. So th that means the, the rural evacuation process is very much in line with the technology innovation process. Uh, process. <clears throat> and also, and also uh, which will be very uh, easier. This is also a way to reduce the cost of the initiative. <clears throat> and also, of course, adequate public finance support is very important. So they need a variety different, different source of public finance. And, 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 and also, the coordination of the, the, the government, the, the central government initiative, and also the local government and the, the grid companies, grid company, and the rural community is very important. So, I, of course, so I think, it's a, of course, there are also a lot of challenges. So, to 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 to, to how to say to, to to complete the mission. So, first, actually, so there is a conflict of interest among grid companies, renewable energy companies, and the farmers. So, and the farmers. So, you, so, so, so in general, the grid company. So sometimes it's, it's are reluctant to do the work. So of course, of course, these the farmers are the beneficiaries, and the the, 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 the renewable companies often sell their products. So and uh, they are at a low price. So they are, don't care about much about uh, the quality. So this is the, some the, some this is the, some the conflicts of the interest. This is the issue we need to address. And also, I think. So the second is, uh, I think it's a universal so issue uh, uh, for, for, for the rural uh, electrification. That is, there is a lack of uh, local maintenance and uh, uh, repairing capacity and the networks. So this is an issue. So you, you need to have to pay particular attention to. So now, so this is the, is, so this is the, the, the talk for the first question. So the second, so it's the, about the China's renewable energy industry development. Uh, so I think China's renewable industry, renewable industry development also provides strong support 
for the rural electrification uh, in the, uh, initiative. <coughs> so I think that the primary here is the primary policies, and uh, which I believe is very important for the China's re uh, renewable industry development. And then first is the renewable energy law. So then the law is first passed in the year uh, 2005 and the revised the, in the year 2009. So the, the how to say, the law uh, so, uh, provides uh, the, the, the general uh, policy for the renewable energy industry development. So including uh, a renewable energy development planning. So that means the national energy nutrition and the local government every year, so every five year, so we have a energy, renewable energy planning. So uh, by setting the targets for the renewable energy. And, and also the uh, guidance and the technical support for the renewable energy industry. So it includes uh, the introduction uh, a series of uh, technical standards, uh, technical standards and, uh, and, uh, and uh, encourage the technology uh, innovation. So by uh, the, the, the public fund. <clears throat> And also, so it, it also, it also uh, requires the grid. Uh, it also, uh, how to say, uh, mentioned it's the obligation for the grid to accept all the uh, electricity from the uh, renewable power generation uh, systems. So the guarantee so of the sale of the electricity and the connection to the grid. And also, so they also uh, has mentioned the renewable energy pricing process so this a lay a foundation for the introduction of the feed-in tariff. So I think this feed-in tariff is a very important policy uh, for the China's renewable energy industry. <clears throat> and also, at the central level, there was a special fiscal fund for the renewable energy development. This fund is used uh, to, uh, to subsidize the investment, subsidize, so, uh, to, to subsidize the investment products so in the rural areas and also be used for the Renewable Energy Resources Survey. <clears throat> so I think this is very important. And also there are some other more specific uh, policy, including the national, uh, the national legally binding targets for non-fossil fuels uh, set. So in every uh, five year uh, plan uh, program. And, uh, and, and also another policy I think uh, it's make China's renewable energy in industry more competitive and become a, a largest uh, exporter so of the uh, of the solar PV and wind in the world is the I think a public private research partner program on technology re-innovation because so in China the wind turbine and also the the solar PV technology actually is transferred from Germany from uh, Dan from Denmark from the Netherlands but after the technology transfer there is a re-innovation to to the, the, the you know with the targets it reduce the cost. So I think that in this context, so the, the Ministry of Science Technology and the, the local government uh, have a special budget to support this, uh, to work together so with the companies to, to do the uh, innovation uh, aimed uh, to reduce the, the cost. So uh, of course, I think I mentioned the feed-in tariff for wind, solar, and biomass and electricity, I think play a very important role for the, for the, the, for, for the how to say, for the growing for, for, for the green of the Chinese uh, solar PV and wind uh, manufacturer uh, industry. <coughs> industry. So we learn the feed-in tariff from Germany. So, okay, I mean, the policy. And also there is a electricity surcharge for renewable energy development. Because in China, the, the primary uh, uh, electricity is from the coal-fired power plants. So, in, so there is a big difference of the generation cost so and how could how the the, the subsidy so I make, to make the renewable uh, energy uh, generation be how to say uh, have a have a regional return so of the investment they need a subsidy the subsidy comes from the the revenue from the electricity surcharge for for renewable energy development that means in China for almost ten years every uh, residents of in China you have to pay a surcharge of electricity this surcharge used to subsidize the feed in tariff. So, and, uh, and oh, of course, there's a lot of uh, tax uh, credit uh, mechanism, uh, mechanisms, so including the, 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 the how to say, the, the, the tax, the, the credit for the VAT, the value added tax at the central government, 
but at the local government, there, are, there, are, there is even more uh, tax uh, credits, including so you can have a, you can how to say you can have the you have you can have a, a cheap land use and also the income uh, tax the, the company's income less reduction etc. So uh, this also help so to reduce the, the, the cost of China's solar PV system and the wind turbine. And, and recently, so to, to solve the wind curtailment, the curtailment of wind and solar PV, so, so this year, we just introduced a new policy, it's the renewable portfolio standards. So, so the, the, the standards, the, the, according to these uh, documents, so there is a mandatory renewable uh, share for the provincial uh, energy uses. So that, this is very, very, very important. And also, so they also, how to say, uh, mentioned, uh, point out, they also, it also points out the obligation so of the grid companies and the power generation companies so to uh, so should have a, a, a certain a share so in their uh, electricity supply or, or, and also the electricity transmission. So I think this is uh, the, 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 the major renewable energy policies. So and uh, it also, it's a, it's a policy to, according to my observation, they are very important for China's renewable energy industry uh, de development. So, and, uh, and, and then, so you can see, so this is the, the, the we are talking, uh, talking about China, so this is the total the energy supply, so of the, the China, of China's energy. You can see, first the size is very big, uh, because it's also very much reflect the size of China's economy. So and the in this context, the China's industrialization process is actually uh, fueled by the by the, 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 the energy uh, consumption. And uh, the second message you can see, the so most of the, uh, the how to say most of the, the, the energy is still fossil fuels, particularly coal. Uh, particularly coal. And this also uh, leads to a lot of problem. The problem. So why is the local pollution? If you visit Beijing, you can see. So for the past uh, five years, we suffer a lot of uh, PM, PM uh, 2.5. Uh, air quality is a big issue so in Beijing. So this is, a big, it's big, it's, so this is the Tiananmen, so you can see. So in a, if uh, how to say air quality is very bad, it's quite, so it's quite difficult to see a clear, the clear picture of Tiananmen. So, uh, and also, of course, so we are the, 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 the largest uh, carbon dioxide emitter in the world. So uh, that means the, we need how to say we, we need to it's time for China to balance the, so the priorities so for the sustainable development. So in the past, so maybe too much priority, uh, too much of priority given to the modernization so of the, the, the industry and also to improve the, the, the quality uh, to promote the, the, the people uh, the, the home and development. But now we are more to more attention to the addressing climate change and the pollution. So now the air pollution. So in this context, so recently, so we have just introduced a new uh, policy uh, program. So this is the China's national emissions trading program. So the program covered eight sectors. So and, uh, and also the total emission regulated so by, the, by, the, by the program so will be 4.5 uh, billion tons of, uh, tons of CO2 emission which will make China the largest uh, the carbon market so in the coming years. Uh, right now, as the EU so it's the largest, has the largest uh, uh, carbon market, I think in the in, in next uh, five years, I think China will be the largest. So I, I, and also, so I think this program, I think it can also largely, uh, how to say, help the rural electrification and also uh, the renewable energy industry. So uh, the first, I think, because the, 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 because of the program, so we will regulate, we will increase the cost of the coal-fired power plants. So that means, uh, make, uh, that means make the renewable generation company, renewable, re renewable company have a better position so in terms of in the competitiveness. So the, the first message. The second, so there will be, the loans will be auctioned. The, 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 the revenue to be used so used will be trying to use so in the rural uh, uh, renewable energy products. So in the uh, how to say the Western uh, underdevelopment regions. So I think this is the uh, this this program can pro, can, pro, 
can provide further support for the rural electrification and also under the, the renewable energy industry by, 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 by this way. So now finally, so these are some concluding remarks. So first, I believe, so sustained strong political will from top leadership are necessary so for the, uh, for the, for the, for the rural electrification and the renewable energy. So and a second, so a step by step approach will be able to allow the rural electrification initiative to be more uh, cost effective in terms of the choice of technology and also the target villages. So that's uh, so the second uh, observation. The third, so the rural electrification uh, initiative is substantial uh, financial support from different sources. So maybe I think in this context, the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, and, the, and uh, the other international uh, financial institutions can play a very important role. And maybe, and also the IEA can play technical support for this initiative. <clears throat> and also I think the institutional arrangement that can coordinate the, the, joint, the efforts of the, the local government, the central government, the local government, and also the industry, and, the, and also the, the local uh, community, also, the, also very important. Uh, and also, last not least, is China's wind and solar PV development are largely attributed to the policy interventions, the so covering the public research development support, the market market based policy instruments, and also command and control policy instruments. So this is what I wanted to talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Zhang, for this uh, this this great overview. And I think it's it's very obvious that uh, what you what you summar what you already summarized yourself, there was a very strong political will in China to make this happen, and it was translated into I would almost say a plethora of of policy instruments to make this really happen on the ground. Very impressive. I'm sure it will raise some questions as well. Let us now, first, before we get into the discussion, move to our last speaker, uh, last but not least, um, um, Mr. Chandra Bhushan, Bhushan, Deputy Director General of Center for Science and Environment from New Delhi. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I want to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, in fact, uh, my previous two presenters have discussed energy access and policies related to uh, renewable energy. I'm going to touch the third point, which is decarbonization. Uh, I have put the title of, of my presentation as, Is the Unthinkable Possible? And uh, in this gathering, I think it is important for all of us to keep this in mind. Is unthinkable possible will decide whether we will solve climate change or not. And therefore, what I'll do is, I'm going to discuss India's energy policy, but in context of, can India do unthinkable? We have done some studies. I will be most happy to present it today. Let's start with what the world thinks about India. And there was a report that was published by IEA in 2015 which was India's energy outlook, very detailed report. And essentially, this report says that India can't get rid of coal. And if you look at all the data that I'm presenting is from, from the IEA report, it says that India's demand will grow, obviously it will grow. Growing population, growing affluence, urbanization will lead to growth in energy demand, will grow by about two and a half times. And coal will remain not only significant, but actually the contribution of coal in India's energy demand will increase from something like 44% to 49%, almost tripling of coal capacity in a period of 25 years. That's not only what IEA says, even government of India also thought that this is what is going to happen. In fact, the world thinks that India's addiction to coal cannot be removed. In power sector, exactly the same uh, projections. We are going to two and a half times increase our power capacity by two and a half times. Though 
the capacity of coal will reduce, still we will double our coal capacity in absolute term, and with all the development in renewable uh, electricity, for example, 67%, uh, sorry, 63% of installed capacity in 2040 will be renewable, but still it will only provide about 25% of our electricity. So that's what the situation was. That's what people thought in 2015. But just six months later, and in fact, the final assessment of IEA was that in our assessment, India is unlikely to reach a situation in which the case for investment in new coal-fired plant capacity disappears. That's what IEA thought. That's what IEA projected. But in, 60, in less than 60 days post this IEA publication of the report, India's Central Electricity Authority, the, the, the key primary uh, regulator of electricity sector, said we don't need any more coal power plant till 2027. And everyone was surprised. We were not. We worked in this sector for 20 years. We were saying that India doesn't need new coal-based power plant. And then they said, we don't need anything for the next 10 years. And the reason they gave was that the plant load factor of our coal and lignite power plants is going down. It peaked in 2007 and 8. It is about 60% now. And if we keep building new coal and, coal and lignite uh, power plant, we are not going to uh, run them economically. Uh, they are going to become economically unviable. We will have huge non-productive assets in bank, and therefore we need to stop building coal-based power plant. Now, this was the simplistic way of saying we don't need coal-based power plant. But there are underlying trends happening in India, both in policy and practice, which will make sure that, frankly, India might not need too many coal-based power plant going ahead for the next 30 to 40 years. And let me tell you why. What are those underlying principles and underlying trends? The first trend, which is very, very visible to everyone, anyone who is looking at energy sector knows that there is a rapid fall in both the prices of renewable energy as well as storage technology. This is how the prices have fall, fallen for solar PV in India in the last six years, at the rate of 20% every year from 2.6 million per megawatt capex in 2010 to 0.8 million per megawatt capex in 2016. 20% annually. That's how solar PV has fallen. Not because India produces a lot of, lot of PV, but thanks to China. China today supplies solar at such cheap price, it has overcapacity. Hopefully you will keep having overcapacity so that we can buy cheap from you. But this is what is the fact. 20% annually. That's how the prices of solar has fallen. The tariff has trembled. It was about nine point in four years, in last four years. This is the data for just last four years. In 2014, solar PV tariff was 9.5 cents per kilowatt hour. It is 3.7. 22% every year drop in last four years. And wind from 6.5 to 3.7. In fact, there is parity between wind and solar PV today in India. 3.7 cents, people expect it will reach about 3 cents in the next two years. And that is why we doubled our renewable capacity in the last four years. From 35 gigawatt in 2014-15 to 69 gigawatt in 2017-18. That's the rapid growth of renewable that has happened. And something more interesting has happened. And what has happened is, in 2016, on-site solar PV became cheaper than the grid tariff for commercial and, and, commercial and uh, industrial establishment. In India, we charge higher from commercial and, and, and industrial establishment, and that's what it happened. In 80% of the states in India, including the most industrialized Maharashtra, commercial and industrial grid tariff were at least 30% higher than if industry decides to put up an on-site solar PV plant. This was the data for 2016. Things are much better today. And the same thing we are witnessing in storage technology. We have seen storage fall by close to 50% in the last three years. And if this trend continues, we will see far, far 80 to 90% reduction in the storage cost over the next 15 years. In fact, 
in 2017, India has installed its first grid-scale battery storage uh, for a small province. Not because we wanted renewable, but because we wanted to stabilize grid. And I'll come back to that point. So this is what you see today. Rapid fall in renewable cost, rapid fall in storage technology. The second trend is what I call is that factor X. Factor X is about efficiency. And in India, we are seeing significant improvement in energy efficiency in building appliances and industries. We now have a mandatory rating of appliances and minimum energy efficiency standards for the past 10 years. We are strengthening it. it is just, there's a lot of work to be done, but significant progress in the last 10 years. We now have a mandatory energy efficiency building code for commercial buildings. It's voluntary for residential, it's going to improve in future. And lastly, we have mandatory energy efficiency standards for industries and we also trade in energy efficiency certificate, what we call it as PAT scheme, perform, achieve, and trade scheme, which is also showing very, very positive result. I want to just give you one example how rapidly things can move. In last three years, this is what has happened. Large amount of India was an incandescent world, 60 watts. Large amount of India is moving to seven watt LED bulbs. And this is what has happened. In six years, from being a $75 million market, the LED bulb today is $1.75 billion market, capturing 60% of lighting market in six years. That's what speed and growth can happen in developing world. And we are seeing that happen. If you provide affordable and good technology, developing world will leapfrog. That's what we are seeing. And this is just the case of LED. We see that in fans, we see that in televisions, we see that in air conditioning. So if you are able to provide affordable solutions and good technology, the poor will leapfrog. The rich will not. And that we are seeing. The third trend is electricity as a prime mover. And I want to tell this gathering that if we think we can solve climate change by continuing using biofuel and ethanol, I don't think that's going to happen. Electricity will have to become the prime mover. And we now have a draft national auto policy, which is going to promote electricity mobility. But I want to talk about something much more interesting that is happening in India, that is in cooking energy. You can see a picture of a roadside stall in rural India, which is cooking on induction cooker. The poor is moving to electricity because it is cheaper and safer. And I think that we all need to internalize. The poor need not go to LPG and then to electricity. There is a big case to move directly from polluting solid fuels to electricity. And therefore, for most developing countries, this is an important question to ask. Do we need to build pipe infrastructure to supply cooking gas when we already have grid to supply electricity? Do we need to have double uh, infrastructure? It's something that we need to very, very carefully evaluate. Fourth, smart grid. As I said, we are building a smart grid not because we want renewable, because it is co-benefit agenda. It will reduce our TND losses. It will reduce theft. It is going to improve quality. And therefore, this is what is happening in India right now. 23 states in India have net metering policy. We have open access. We are putting smart meters, not for renewable, but to stop theft, which is smart meters at feeder, distribution transformers, and at large consumers, smart bi-directional meters. And then we are having battery storage, again, to stabilize the grid and improve the quality. So if you see smart grid as a co-benefit agenda, it is going to help the grid, but also allow you to transition uh, to the re renewable energy. Fifth, people have talked about it. My, my previous colleague from China talked about public demand to improve air quality. Huge problem in India. Huge public pressure. We don't want to, to have our children suffer from lung diseases. And therefore, parents are talking about reducing air pollution. And as you can see, for the first time two years back, India did something unthinkable to close down a coal-based power plant. It has never happened in the history of India. In fact, people thought that it's almost like a, you know, a heresy to close down a coal-based power plant. 
Well, that's what we did. We closed down because we wanted to solve air pollution. And we will close down more because of public pressure, because of air quality improvement demands. And that's what is the fifth trend. And therefore, if you look at the contribution of coal power to, uh, plant to India's environmental footprint, accounts for more than 50% of all industrial pollution. And therefore, we now have a new pollution standard to be met by 2022. So you are saying reduction in prices of renewable energy, increase in prices of coal because you want to improve the environmental performance of coal-based uh, power plant. Completely opposite trends. Lastly, climate change. And I want to, I, I want to play you this because just see how temperature has increased in India in the last 116 years. Hundred sixteen years data. In three seasons, we, we do not meet our commitment of Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees. So it's no more a theoretical exercise. Climate change is there. We are experiencing it. And this is the data. The poorest is getting hit in India. The poorest of the poor. In 2013, about 0.35 million hectare of, of land, agricultural crops were damaged. In 2015, we are looking at 18 million hectare. So the vote bank is getting hit. And therefore, there is pressure, not from the international community. India can very well say, I want to become China. I want to add as much coal as I want. I want to make sure that I have energy access. It doesn't matter from where I get. But because of domestic pressure, India will have to act on climate change. Now, if you take these six trends, what do you get? You get a completely different world. This is what we are right now. 57% of India's electricity capacity is on coal. And about 35% is renewable, including nuclear and hydro. If you exclude nuclear, it's too small, about 2%. But about 30, one third of our capacity is based on renewable energy. The government of India has decided to install 175 gigawatts of renewable electricity by 2022. This is what the target is both domestically as well as internationally. This is what we have installed so far. We have installed 70, 15 gigawatt is under construction, and 25 gigawatt has been tendered. So of 175 gigawatt, in 2018, we are in the pro process of meeting about 110 gigawatt. We have four more years to go for 175, and we are quite confident that we will not only meet 175, we will over exceed it. And if we do that, this is, going to what, this is what will happen in 2027. Just simple calculation. We will have from 57% coal capacity, it will reduce to 39%. And two thirds of our capacity will be non-fossil fuel in 2027. Move ahead in 2032, the, the contribution of fossil fuel will be only about 37%. 63% will be non-fossil fuel. If this happens, will India need new coal power plant even post-2027? Okay. This is what will happen in 2032. Between today and 32, we will add about 428 gigawatt of electricity. Of this, 66 will be fossil, 362 will be non-fossil. For every one megawatt of coal capacity, we will add six megawatt of renewable energy. This will be a renewable energy world. My friends, it's not going to be a, a fossil fuel world. And something more interesting will happen. By 2025, even if we do additional storage cost, the way it is falling down, in most states of India, renewable with the storage will be viable for high paying consumers, rich, Residential consumer, industrial and commercial consumers is going to be financially viable. And by 2030, storage is going to be viable both for utility scale as well as from a small scale sector. Now, this is the unthinkable we need to visualize. And the unthinkable of peaking of coal and end of coal in India. 
Our estimation shows that unlike the projection of IEA, coal-based power India will peak by about 250 gigawatt in 2022. Maybe plus minus 50, but 250 to 300 gigawatt, that's where coal is going to peak in India. With peak coal consumption of about a billion ton, we consume about 600 million ton in electricity sector right now. 40% more, give 40% more. Peak at 1 billion ton. And if we take the age of coal as 30 years, that's what our policy says, we can get rid of coal in the next 30 to 40 years. This is the unthinkable we need to think about. But the biggest unthinkable is, if India can do this, so can China, so can Europe, so can America, so can most countries of the world. And we can meet two degrees centigrade. Thank you very much. Wow, that was uh, really impressive. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Buzan. I think there's, there's few things that economists like to hear so much than that relative prices matter. And that's what you also, I think, very strongly show here, how that can make a huge, uh, huge difference uh, going forward. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have, uh, we have, uh, we had three uh, very uh, great pre presentations. We have our panelists there, and they have been um, also extremely disciplined in terms of the time, so that we have really some time for Q&A, for debate with, uh, with the audience. I hope we have uh, somebody running around with microphones. A mic box, okay, wow, I can throw. I have already uh, one, two questions here, please. It's a great device, but I hope it works. It's not working yet. Can we turn it on? Uh... Or, do, or do we have a, another, uh, um, an old-fashioned microphone also available? We have, we have yet yeah. one second. We'll get to all of you, don't worry, one by one. Do we have some technology available here? There? Oh. Okay, it's working now. Yes, huh? ah, there we you got go. It. Okay. So my question for the last speaker, <clears throat> uh, because I, I, I totally agree, I guess, with your vision, and uh, indeed we might see the unthinkable happening. Uh, the displacement of coal, I think, is quite clear. Uh, it has been a trend that started from uh, the OECD countries, from Europe. Uh, many nations have been adopting uh, this trend to phase out coal. Do you see a place for gas? Because uh, India has also started a very ambitious plan in terms of uh, uh, building some uh, gas capacity and uh, also building some LNG terminals. So where do you see this? Uh, because it was not uh, really in your uh, presentation there. Wait, I, I, see so many, I see so many arms. Maybe we should collect a couple of questions. Is that, is that all right? We should collect like three or something and then uh, we have one here. Can yep. You? I'm Andrew from IRIA, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Actually, my question is to the last two speakers on China and India. I think you mentioned that this, this, this story and the experience of uh, China and India is very inspiring, and it could be a lesson for the other African countries. And uh, given these experiences, I would like to deepen your insights uh, on two aspects. One is all this transformation need a uh, private sector participation. And how dynamic and what difficulties uh, the countries are facing in engaging the private sector in the transformation, though you have the political will. The second question is uh, all these policy proposals that is, you mentioned need a uh, deep involvement and a deep uh, research capacity. And what is the role of academia in advising uh, uh, this policy-making community? Thank you. We'll go to this lady here, and then we go there, OK? Wow. I, I didn't know that I'm that good at catching. So uh, Ning Lin here. Um, I represent RBAC, which is a, a forecasting com um, provider from the United States. I have a question. I'm glad the previous two um, 
people ask a similar thing. So I think that my question is to all three of you. I think one of the very big theme today is about, you know, um, about China and India, that it's possible that we can curb back on the coal consumption and to reach the goal. Um, and there is kind of a divergence of view between the, the later two speakers on the country level versus IEA's um, sustainable development scenario. So one of the questions, I think, to me, that is the reliability, right? So one time you cut back on coal and really go back to renewable, which is great. The installation capacity, everybody see that. But the question is, in order to actually stabilize the grid, it is an integrated effort between the public company, national grid, and private sector. And that is something that I like to each of the speaker to address because I think that's something that I like to know that from the IEA perspective, how do you guys see that as natural gas as a bridging fuel as someone already asked? And also for India, especially I think it's very ambitious and admirable that you want to get rid of all coal, right? But if you get rid of all coal with the current technology, there is, you know, what the things needs to happen to make sure the reliability. And, you know, for China, it's the same thing. We have coal and a lot of installation capacity of investment, but one of the big gaps that is curb back a lot of investment and waste a lot of investment in the past couple of years is the national grid has to make sure to keep up the pace of the installed capacity of renewables, otherwise it's not gonna stabilize the grid. So I think that's kind of my question too. Mr. Busan first, please. We go like that, yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, quick answer about the role of gas. Uh, we don't have much gas. In fact, uh, even our hope of getting shale gas, and there's, there was some estimation that we will have uh, coal methane and shale gas is not materializing because uh, the quality is not good enough, the investments are high, and therefore we have to depend on imported gas. So we will have gas, but uh, the, the contribution of gas uh, uh, is not going to be in any scenario more than 10%, uh, because it's just too expensive. To give you an example, we have two gas-based power plants in Delhi, the capital of India. Uh, the, currently, the tariff of gas power plants is double that of solar. So the regulators are asking, why should we run gas if I can get the same electricity at half the cost from the solar? So there is, and it will be similar to solar with battery storage if we distribute batteries to all households. So I also, and one point that I would like to make, don't think about the storage as one massive megawatt scale or gigawatt scale storage. It's a modular technology. You can have storage in all your cars and all your houses. That's the another idea people are, are toying about. So gas, not more than 10%. Uh, experience of India and China, uh, private sector, uh, Renewable energy has grown because of private sector. Government involvement in private sector is very, very small. Uh, and government controls largely the fossil fuel industry and, and distribution and transmission. Uh, very important, uh, the cost of renewable has come down because of competition. Uh, if it would have been same as, as, as public sector, I don't think we would have achieved such, such impressive results. Very important role of academia. Uh, the weaker part in India, the research capability, uh, is something that, that needs to be uh, further uh, strengthened. Uh, last question was about, uh, can we get rid of coal? Uh, Madam, we are not talking about uh, getting rid of coal tomorrow. We are talking about three decades, okay? And three decades is one and a half generation. It would be shame for all of us here if we cannot transform energy and save ourselves in one and a half generation. So if we are looking about transition, it is not going to happen tomorrow, it is not going to happen in the next 10 years, it is going to take place in the next 30 years. We have time to make this transition, even if we proceed at the rate we are proceeding right now, I think we can make that transition. Yes, Professor Zhang, please. So, so it's about, about how to reduce the, how to say, about get rid of the coal. So the opinions are very much shared with my India colleagues. So, and, uh, so I think in the context of China, right, you can see, if you look at the data of, uh, for the recent years, the coal is almost uh, peaking already. So, it, so you, the, 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 you already. So the, but I think, but, but still, we need still substantial efforts to really have a 
for the sharp decline. So, so in, in the future, but I think there are lots of opportunities there for really to reduce for the the coal uh, sharp declining. So in the, the in, in, in in two decades, as you mentioned. So I think first is uh, the cost uh, of the coal fire port and reaching electric coal fire electricity is increasing. So and uh, at the same time, so the the, the cost of electricity renewable electricity is declining. So I think it will create uh, much uh, chance for the renewable energy to replace the the, the coal. And uh, so we, if we look at the any uh, how to say any uses of coal, so in general, you cannot you can you can you can't see any increase in the future. So I think from the demand side of coal, it's already, uh, it's already there. It's already, uh, how to say, flagged, become flagged. So I think in the future, it will be reduced. So in this context, I think, uh, uh, so in the, two in, the, in the next two decades, so I think the China's coal consumption could be reduced substantially. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think many <coughs> things to talk about here. I think. Um, First and foremost, uh, in the case of India, I think what is very relevant to, to look at is that India is in the strange situation of a country that still has unmet electricity demand, but uh, has a huge extent of overcapacity. And I think um, my esteemed uh, colleague, Mr. Bhushan, pointed to the low capacity factors that are prevalent in, uh, in India. Right? I think what is what this points to is actually a market design issue that uh, wasn't uh, wasn't touched upon. I think um, uh, we all agree that there is a huge prospect for for renewables, uh, even in the absence of uh, stronger climate policy. In our central outlook, um, over the next decade, um, solar PV becomes the cheapest source of generation, as we pointed out um, as one of our key highlights of the World Energy Outlook 2017. Um, renewables and in particular PV becomes the cheapest source of generation over the next 10 years across the entire country in India and China alike. Right? So now what's happening? Why, why doesn't it take that scale of that thinking the impossible that, um, um, that, uh, that uh, my uh, preceding speaker was just talking about? Both countries have a very young coal-fired fleet, very young. Right? More than 50% of the existing capacity in China was built over the last 10 years. Right, so this is the issue. The, the point is, do you retire them early or do you not retire them early? Solar PV will become the cheapest source of generation in China, no doubts about that, but the problem will be, um, do you retire the existing capacity early or do, do you not? The same will happen in India at the end of the day. And this is where there is a contradiction here. It's a way of thinking about how do you think about the long term. We don't speculate what the country will be doing. Um, the government will be doing what kind of policy it will be adopting, but we are trying to look into what country uh, policies are currently in place. Right? And in India, actually, the coal fleet is even younger than in China. It's, I think it's roughly 60% or probably even more than 60% that are younger than 10 years. Right? So th these are the, the critical uh, issues that we are talking uh, that we have to talk about. It's about making projections for the next. It's actually two decades. Right? So until 2040, it's not very long. Uh, long way out and actually uh, 2032 is only uh, 14 years from now. So this is the critical issue that um, we'll be um, facing in these countries. And there is an important point here and um, uh, the colleague um, from the United States, I believe, um, I was talking about here is um, stability, obviously, right? It's about how to integrate renewable energy resources. I would um, definitely second what um, has been um, said before. There is not a strong role for gas and power generation, neither in China nor in uh, nor in India that you can uh, that you can expect right now. Right in our projections, they don't material uh, gas-fired generation doesn't materialize at scale. But you have a huge untapped flexibility potential in the coal-fired power fleet. Right? We are working actually in particular with China um, on this and uh, under the Clean Energy Ministerial Initiative in order to try to um, work out where are these untapped potentials. Right? It is about um, increasing the flexibility of the power grid. It's huge, uh, or, or the power system. It's huge countries, uh, really, really huge. I mean, uh, for us in Europe here is a bit of a, a scale issue at times, right? That we don't really recognize. But it's huge countries, right? So mm. you have a couple of options um, to increase flexibility. Uh, transmission and distribution grids are one, right? But coal-fired power, f increasing the flexibility of the coal fleet is another. Right? And how this will play out? What will be the choices that are made? 
by the various different governments will determine what is going to be happening with coal because the point on cheapest generation of solar PV is taken. That's, there's no doubts about that. Um, just a point probably to answer to the question about um, that was raised, the second question, I believe, that was raised about the experiences from China and India and how they can be inspiring for Africa um, and what could be the role of academia here. I think these are the things to work out, right? I think it's about trying to, trying to discuss what are the various different choices and how may they affect um, the energy landscape uh, in various different countries. Because it's about choices, right? It's about choices that uh, energy stakeholders and uh, policy makers may or may not be seeing right? and may or may not be taking as a result. Okay, thank you so much, Timur. We can do one last round of questions, but really quick, 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 eh? Don't, quick question and quick answers. Yes, um, there was a sort of a Cinderella issue in this, which is uh, transportation and oil. The fact that India and China could double their coal capacity is overlooked by the idea that if they go to the European or American level, they will multiply by five the use of cars per person. How about the use of oil for transportation and the problem associated with that? No word was given here this morning. Uh, by the way, I'm Italian and I applaud Ferrari winning the, you know, with the good uh, oil, of course, and, and gasoline winning the uh, champions, uh, the GP yesterday, in Canada. The lady there, can you catch? Good morning. My question is for Dr. Guel. Uh, my name is Maria Yetano from Wuppertal Institute. Um, what would you say is the main driver in the scenario where um, Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa does not achieve full electrification by 2030? Um, I mean, in general, whether it's the grid, the off-grid not making it, uh, whether it's enabling environment, whether it's finance. And in other words, what, is, what are the key solutions to make sure that that business as usual path does not happen? And I'm interested both from a um, policy perspective and also in terms of uh, are we creating a narrative that this is a lost cause? And how are we going to do something about it? I can't throw it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, which, where am I going? I'm sorry, we can't, we can't have everybody. Uh, this is the last one because otherwise We'll run out of time and the organizer will kill me. Thank you. Please. Aaron Praktiknew from Aachen University. I have a question on the SDG 7.1, on the strategy to achieve that goal, actually, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I was wondering, um, in the case of India and China and Southeast Asia, isn't industrialization actually the best strategy to achieve electrification? Um, um, how is the take of the IEA on this? Okay, can we, can you guys pass the microphone? You can start and then pass it back. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll run through all quiz, um, because we're really running out of time, I'll run through yeah. all um, questions quickly. Transport issue right. I think is super important. I myself started working on transport, so I second the importance of looking in, at, uh, at transport. Uh, it's a very important aspect. Um, not only passenger cars that you're touching upon, but also trucks, um, which are a big component of um, global oil demand growth today and um, looking out in the future, very, limit poli very limited policy attention. I think China is in the very rare situation. We have looked at this in depth last year in the context of our China energy outlook. It's in the rare situation which might actually jump. Uh, it's not, not necessarily the problem of ownership, right? I mean, a car ownership will be rising substantially in the country, but will probably be able to, um, to uh, jump the motorization um, elements to electric cars, right? I mean, this is something um, where the current policy environment is, uh, is enormously conducive uh, to that in China, and um, probably um, our co Chinese colleague can uh, touch upon that um, much more in detail. But I, we don't expect in our projections um, China nor India to reach the level of, um, of uh, US and uh, European Union in terms of car ownership um, over the next two decades for a variety of reasons. Uh, happy to discuss that um, afterwards. 
Now, on the uh, electricity access narrative, I think there is an important element here, and I think this was pointed out extremely nicely by Professor Chang. It is about policy dedication, and it's about um, uh, policy, long-term policy commitment, right, when it comes to um, electricity and what's holding back um, electricity access in our projections. We very much look into policies, right? We don't want to speculate what a country is doing. Um, we want to highlight how it can be overachieving on these targets, hence the development of these kind of sustainable development scenario pathways. Um, but what's really holding back here is, um, is, is a matter of um, policy ambition. It's a matter of um, finance, availability of finance, right, um, on the continent of Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, uh, it's uh, also a matter of perception, quite frankly. Um, I spoke quite at length with some development banks, uh, KFW in Germany, for example, is, uh, is one, and there is a matter of perception that they'd rather wait for coal-fired generation to come along still in some countries, I mean, we like it or not, um, rather than to go into the cheaper sources. For us, we map out a cheaper pathway, right, which is with um, solar PV, um, but this is something that still has uh, to be communicated. And in terms of the failure narrative, I'm not sure that this is what we are um, trying to say here. Um, in fact, we've been accused to be overly optimistic um, when it comes to our access projections, so I'm a little surprised to hear now about the failure narrative for Sub-Saharan Africa. We just want to highlight that there is an important work that has to be done for Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's not about um, doomsday or failure, it's about saying, like, let's get our act together. Right? I think um, this is something um, that um, is really at the heart of, of these kind of scenario work in particular. Now, when it comes to SDG 7.1 and um, the con uh, context Southeast Asia industrialization versus Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, granted, industrialization um, has been a, a, a big driver, um, obviously, in, um, in uh, many parts of Southeast Asia, um, China, um, in order to make um, electrification happening. I think these kind of things, I mean, obviously that this may or may not happen, but we are talking about the poorest of the poorest countries here, right? So what we are trying to do is um, to, to make the step hap uh, happening at the very f first point in the development curve here, right, in, many, in, 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 in some ways, right? So you're trying to give education, you're trying to um, prepare the grounds for industrialization um, to happen, right? I don't think these are mutually exclusive and I don't think we can easily extrapolate what happened in, um, uh, in Asia um, towards Sub-Saharan Africa. But I take your point. You're um, obviously um, completely right there. So, and first, I would like to say some remarks about the, the electrification of the transportation sector. So, I think, uh, so first, uh, China, so most of the cities, uh, it's better big cities, suffer air pollution issues. And uh, it, it, it looks like what the, the electric vehicle is a very impo is an important option to address this use. The second, and also electrification of the transportation sector is the ultimate solution for for the control for reduce the carbon dioxide emission. So in, in the in Chinese transportation sector. So in this context, I think in China there is there is very strong motivation for uh, for the electrification uh, of the transportation sector. So this is one issue. So I think um, also we hope so China can also be play a more leading role in terms of the how say, uh, in terms of the diffusion of the electric vehicles. So we can also keep uh, maintain the mo momentum. So with a new innovative policy and the institutional arrangement uh, uh, in place, not just uh, the subsidy. So now China's uh, electrification the vehicle. Uh, electric vehicle diffusion is largely attributed to the uh, subsidy, but now we are we, we are now we are discussing about some more, uh, how to say, innovative and uh, market-based uh, instruments. So I think in this way, so China will be maintain the momentum of the electric electric vehicle development. The second issue that I think is very important: the China has attached increasing importance to the soft soft collaboration. So even so, in the one road, one belt, one belt initiative, and much attention has been paid, paid to the environmental impacts. So and uh, to to how to say the introduction of the advanced uh, power generation technology, in, uh, including the renewable technology, and and will be a green, uh, how to say, uh, will be a green one road, one belt. So I think China has already notified these issues. I think in the future. 
uh, I think there will be more opportunity, collaboration opportunities between China and, uh, and uh, Africa. Maybe we can also transfer some of the experience uh, what happened in China to the, to the, the practice so in the African nations. So we, we hope so. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to make a general point that people generally, s I, I hear it from, from my friends in Europe and America that what will happen if